We gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. And our opening words this morning are by Amy Mackenzie Quinn. And she writes, welcome to this common sacred space. Welcome to this common sacred space. Common because we are all welcome. Sacred because here we transform the ordinary and attend to the profound. We carry with us our regrets, doubts, fears, stories, laughter. May they inspire our worship. Above all, may we each meet what we need most to find on this day in this common sacred space. We will now recite the Litany of Compassion, written by Dennis McCarty, and I invite you to um, respond as we read each piece by saying, may we reach out in honesty and love. Can we try that once together? May May we we reach reach out out in in honesty honesty and and love. love. Great. In the spirit of love, harmony, and remembrance, we stand too often divided, too often set apart from one another in heedless ways. We seek to be compassionate, but our vision may be clouded or distracted. We too often go forward day by day and look without seeing. May we reach out. May we work to heal the divisions which separate Earth's children from one another. May we peer through the mists of deception which hide and deny violence, mists enclosing those who suffer. And may we not allow the misuse of our fellow souls to hide in broad daylight. May we. When we see the afflicted, however they may be afflicted, may we not shrink away. May we not blame suffering on the one who suffers. May we be courageous enough to perceive suffering and compassionate enough to attend to the voices of those who suffer. May we reach out. When we see prejudice, when we hear evil speaking, When we witness the rough hand or the scathing word laid upon the helpless or innocent, may we resolve to work toward unity and justice. May we May we not turn away from the wounded head of the abused. May we not accept the twisted reasoning by which the oppressor declares himself the victim. May we. Let our gratitude for good fortune in our lives lead us not to complacency, but to awareness. Awareness of those whose lives are shadowed by abuse or neglect. May we not ignore signs of deceit or denial that hide brutality. May we reach out. In all things, may those who suffer ever be able to approach us. Find a kindly ear and supporting hand. May we witness for love and justice at every level of relationship. May we nurture a keen eye and a strong and loving heart for any who fear the hurtful rod, the cutting voice, the chain of oppression, great or small. May we reach out in love and justice. Thank you, Allie. Thank you for leading our service. A sanctuary, in its original meaning of the word, is a sacred place, such as a shrine. It actually comes from the Latin word sanctuarium, which is a container for holy things, a box, often. Uh, But it's expanded to include perhaps a gathering place for cherished people. Now, it might seem odd to have a room in a Unitarian church that's called a sanctuary. We really aren't, by most common definitions, a terribly holy people. There are even a good many people who are amazed that the sign out front says 
church. And a fair number of them are probably in this room. Yes, for some who are very religious in the traditional sense, and some who are anything but religious, the words Unitarian and church are oxymorons. Still, the plaque right outside this room identifies this place as a sanctuary. I will take a little credit for that. When we moved to this building over a dozen years ago, one of my quiet little causes was naming this room our sanctuary instead of hall or meeting room or something else. And I just sort of subversively started calling it that early in the planning phases, and the name stuck. No one seemed to fight me on it too much. But I was being most deliberate. And if you know me, you'll know that I'm actually pretty humanistic in my own theological outlook. But this word mattered for me. Why? This needs to be a special place for our community. Hall just doesn't capture that. When we moved in, it wasn't special at all. It was just a shiny new room, interestingly designed with kind of a groovy roof. But it wasn't ours. It was, it was unfamiliar. It was unused. Nothing had happened here. We owned it, but it wasn't ours in any meaningful sense. It had not become a sanctuarium for our stories or our memories. It had not been lived in yet. We were going to have to make it into a special place. Over a dozen years, that's changed. There have been weddings and memorials, child dedications, shared suppers, congregational meetings, musical performances, mitten tree services and blue Christmases, social justice events, youth sleepovers, blanket ceremonies, flower communions, regional gatherings, welcoming of new members, and a whole lot more. Now, there is some magic in this room, but not the kind of magic that is sent down by some deity. No relic makes this a sanctified place. No sacred lamp marks the presence of the divine. What I say, what makes this room a sanctuary for me are the stories that we have poured into it. The activities that we have done together, the memories we have created and continue to create. What makes this place a sanctuary is the living that we have done here as a community. Now, the other critical definition of the word sanctuary carries a sense of safety and protection, hence that last hymn, When I Am Frightened. In the legal traditions of many countries, there are enshrined rights of asylum in churches. In fact, from the 4th through the 17th centuries, English law recognized the right of asylum. That if some criminal on the run from the law made it into the confines of a church or a monastery, that person was safe and could not be arrested for as long as they remained within those walls. About the year 600, King Ethelbert established the first formal set of laws, written down codified laws governing sanctuary and churches. And they would last a thousand years until they were abolished in 1623 by King James I, he of the King James Bible fame. He was a great supporter of the Church of England's religious conformity and he had many enemies among the Catholic Church and other Protestant reformers And no doubt his repeal of the sanctuary laws were in support of him rooting out his enemies. Nevertheless, the tradition of sanctuary has hung on, if not for criminals necessarily, then at least for political dissidents. In the 1980s, many Central American refugees were fleeing a spate of wars in their various homelands, and they sought sanctuary in the U.S., and were pretty much refused, so they went to American churches. Now, refugee status was much easier for those people who managed to make it up to Canada, but for some reason, Central Americans thought Canada was a frozen place, so it wasn't their first choice. 
Now, when I was a divinity school student in Chicago, I was actually part of a team that would stay once a week or so with the Guatemalan family. And our job was to serve as deterrence for the INS and as witnesses should their officers come in to snatch this family from a church-owned property. The U.S. government was leery of violating religious space. There was no law, never was a law in the United States protecting churches other than separation of church and state. It was simply a convention and a perception that dragging people from churches would be really bad public relations for the government. Now, another modern legal variation seems to be the religious sponsorship of refugee families. This congregation has supported refugees over the decades from Laos, Bosnia, and most recently, Syria. Fortunately, we were working with the government on these files, and so we did not have to take them into sanctuary per se, but many of the same traditions and rules applied. And helping people find safe places from a hostile government in their land really is the essence of sanctuary. Across the country during the Syrian crisis, the largest group of sponsors after the federal government itself were the various congregations in Canada like ours. And about 10 years ago, our large congregation, the First Unitarian Church of Ottawa, did in fact grant sanctuary to a gentleman from Asia who was under a deportation order. He lived in the church for over a year. And as a matter of solidarity, the Reverend Fred Cappuccino, who many of you know from his Child Haven work, moved into the church with him on a small little cot in a boiler room. The man gave back to the church in the form of sharing his fabulous cooking skills. And once he finally did receive his ministerial permit to stay in Canada, the church helped him open a really, really wonderful restaurant just down the road. In the U.S. these days, there are a number of our congregations promising or giving sanctuary to longtime illegal residents threatened by deportation under the current administration. It is an unpopular immigration policy for liberals, and many churches feel it's their responsibility to resist. So, we're working with two different um, definitions of sanctuary today. First, the repository of sacred things. Well, we Unitarians don't generally hold with the most common concept of sacred things. There are things that we value and appreciate, like this pulpit, carved decades ago by a man named Robert Block, who I only finally met this week. He came down from the north, was visiting Edmonton, and wanted to come. He also carved music stands that we have, but he made this pulpit many, many years ago. And it was it's really wonderful, because he tried to create a piece of art that spoke to who we are. So it starts with the old logo from the Unitarian Universalist Association, which was very much in use at the time that he carved it. It is the classic flaming chalice with two interlocking circles representing the roots of Unitarianism and Universalism. And then around the outside here, if you come up and see it, he's carved in several deeply meaningful religious symbols of world religions, but not just. For example, he has Islam and Judaism side by side. Man's got a sense of humor. Next to Amnesty International. And then there is a a symbol representing indigenous peoples. And this was four decades ago, something like that, that he put that in. And then over on this side, we have... I'm not quite sure what that one is, but Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism. But the symbols that I like the most are the ones he has right here, front and center, right under the whoever's speaking, right under their nose. And it has the hands of a grown-up handing the earth into the hand of a child. Now, I love that one. So this, I think, is the symbol of our most significant obligation, the one to create a better world in which our children can live and grow. I'm not sure how well we're scoring on that particular test these days, but the promise is there and the reminder 
is right here for everyone to see. And we have other things in this room. We value our banners. The banners, if you don't know, uh, the oldest ones of the most traditional religions came from a group of women in Ohio who made them as an enormously successful fundraiser for their church almost 40 years ago. Since then, we've added our own, replaced a couple that, well, one got stolen, so we had to replace the Taoism banner. But we've added a couple of our own, like the pagan Triscoll and humanism. And pretty soon, thanks to the work of the Bantaro Society, we'll finally, finally, after years of wanting to, be adding an indigenous people's banner, indigenous religious banner. And I think that's wonderful. And then we have our chalice, our flaming chalice. I really don't know its provenance. I'm sure some of you do. But it's been here for at least 25 or 30 years. And last Sunday, longtime member Dosha Lisney was back visiting from Calgary. And she used to take pride in taking this and de-waxing it and polishing it at least once a year. And she had something to say about my negligence in keeping up her tradition. I have to get on that this week. So sure, we have things, things we would like to preserve, but they aren't holy in any traditional sense. But over the, you know, over the years, in this space, we have invested these things with meaning. Many of these objects were carried by hand, lovingly, from our old church when we moved, and carried, I might add, in a blinding snowstorm. How very Edmonton. They symbolize the memories and the aspirations, the life of this community that has happened in this beloved building, and they each say something about who we are. Consider as well, this is where I got to the part about detailing Mr. Bach's pulpit, but I also want to add in one other thing that, frankly, I only just kind of noticed. But if you take a look on your way out, or maybe get your coffee and come back in, at the table on which the hymnals are stacked. That's a table that's been refinished. It comes from Victoria School. It's one of the old desks. And if you look along the side, there's a wonderful set of plaques dedicated to the strong women of this church and names many of our female members who have died over the years. It's a memorial just to keep their names and their presence alive in this place. Consider that as well. These are artifacts, but they are artifacts that tell our story or remember our story in some way. They remind us who we were and in many cases what we have stood for over time. Are these merely cherished objects or are they sacred artifacts? You tell me. I'm not sure I can see a distinction. To me, the sacred is something that comes from within us. And you've all had your conversation, so afterwards you can tell me if I'm right or wrong about this. For me, the sacred is something that comes from within us, not from an external deity. Even when I've had the opportunity to visit the great religious sites in various places, ours and other religions, it isn't the holy relics or the magnificent pieces of art that move me. It's the accumulation of living. There's something meaningful to me about praying or worshiping or simply sitting and admiring in a place where generations of others have done the same thing. It leaves me with a tingly feeling that I am connected to something greater than just myself. I feel part of, a, of the moving stream of human time, like I belong to something extraordinary, something that has existed for a very long time and will continue to exist long after I have gone. For me, that is sacred. This room is a holy place because of the memories it holds, because of the moments of living that have happened here. I was married right on that bottom step in December last year. My youngest daughter was dedicated just on the edge of the carpet, right there. She was the first child dedicated in this building. Each December, I have the delightful pleasure of wandering over there and presiding over and mostly making sure that the mitten tree doesn't fall down as people are loading it up with gifts for the, for the community that needs it. 
And usually I sit back in that corner where Robert is when I listen to Coriolis do their magnificent services. I can sit anywhere in this room and recall in my, or even see in my mind's eye the moments that have made this place special for me. The memorials, the pageants, the performances, the speakers. I have been moved in this place. I have been comforted in this place. I have been entertained in this place. That's sacred enough for me. Well, if definition number one is the repository of sacred things, definition number two is a place of safety and even resistance. Next week, our service is going to look at this question of safety, and the youth will be involved in this because they've done a lot of work on this. We'll be looking at the policies that we have in place that serve to make this a physically and emotionally safe place for everyone, all ages. But safety goes beyond policy. First and foremost, it is a feeling, a comfortable feeling that liberates people from their fear and their anxiety. And when people feel safe, there are extraordinary opportunities. Listen when people share about the candles that they light on some Sundays. There are tender things spoken about. People are taking risks. They are trusting us, you, with their vulnerabilities. And then there are the silent candles like today, which sometimes may represent things even too tender for anyone to discuss. A community like this is intentionally gathered to welcome people of every stage of life. And it's obvious, in obvious ways, that includes old and young, wealthy and financially challenged, healthy people with physical concerns, people of different ethnic and racial racial backgrounds. But in less obvious ways, it includes people who are struggling with mental and emotional challenges, who are hurt and wounded and looking for a place to be safe and to be appreciated, a place to talk about their fears sometimes. People who are here when the weight of the struggles of those they care about are too hard for everyone to bear. And we want this to be a safe place for us when we are broken and looking for healing. And that pretty much describes us some of the time. Not always. Lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend is one of the hymns we like to sing. May all who seek here find a kindly word. May all who speak here feel they have been heard. I've always loved that one because it's such a a recognition of humanity. Feeling that you've been heard. That's a beautiful thing. And that's what we strive for in the creation of our sanctuary. It's not just a room. It's not just a gathering place. We have and we must continue to work hard to make this room a safe place where people can tell their stories, however haltingly. Speak their truths, however much courage it takes knowing that they will be heard and kept safe from attack or denigration. If this is truly to be a sanctuary, it must be the place of radical hospitality of which Karen Mills spoke last week. And that means opening our hearts to the things that people say and the way that they act. It means silencing our judgmental side. Oh, that's a hard one. Silencing our judgmental side even if it's only for the time we are in this place. Our pulpit, our chalice, our banners, they do not make this room into a sanctuary. Only you can make this a place of sanctuary, for you are the most sacred objects here, with your Unitarian values and your good-hearted and compassionate character. This room is the center of our community, It is where the loving heart of UCE beats and will continue to beat so long as you treat this place and these people as special, as sacred. You are the sanctuary. Amen. These words 
by a friend of mine, Leslie Takahashi. This is a prayer for when words fail, for when they are not big enough or small enough to slip into the little cracks left in our hearts by unbearable pressures. This is a prayer for when the biggest noun cannot know the enormity of joy or when the most active verb is paralyzed in the face of grief unuttered, horror undescribed, or loss beyond accounting. This is a prayer for when words, precious emblems though they are, cannot take into their embrace the hugeness of experience with the expanse of indebtedness or the many tangles of complexity and confusion. This is a prayer when we must sit with our breath, needing the small truths we can touch as if they were therapy for our restless hands. This is a prayer who, for all who have known the large void of hope, which is trauma. This is a prayer for wounded hearts and bodies, for those whom we ought to always remember and sometimes choose to forget. This is a prayer that begins with gratitude for what we can understand and know and ends with humility, which remind us that it is not all ours to do. This is a prayer for those times when words fail and all is left is breath to lead us from this moment to the next. This is a prayer for all who have been lost, that in our memory they might be found. May we be the ones to make it so.